<laughs> it would be a wolf, but eh? I'm so full. People might yet win it here for Wolves. Flash in the shot. What a goal! Hi everybody and welcome back to the Wolves Fancast YouTube channel. We've got another special episode for you today. Uh, I'm glad to be joined by ESPN's uh, David Cartledge. Uh, you may also know him from the Football Rambles on the Continent shows as well. David, how are you doing? I'm doing well. Nice to join you. Great. Um, we're obviously going to be talking about uh, Yulan Lopetegui. We've we've done quite a bit on him already in terms of his his recent work uh, down at Sevilla, but we're going to delve a little bit deeper into his beginnings uh, as a manager. Um, starting first of all with his time at Spain under twenty ones, um, David. In terms of um, the group of players that he had to work with there, um, I've listed a few names here. Uh, a hell of a lot of talent who have gone on to do great things with their careers. Um, so no surprise really for them to have won the under-21s tournament at that time? Or do you think it was a lot to do with uh, the good work of Yulen himself? Um, I mean, don't get me wrong. Um, there was an incredible amount of talent there. Um, but other managers have had a lot of talent as well with Spain's uh, youth ranks and, and not managed to not do anything with it or haven't played as well. I'd probably say that Lopetegui, the way that he got together the Spain in the 19s and then he got promoted to the under 21s. Um, it was exceptional work. He, uh, he didn't just rely upon having brilliant individual talent. He created a very clear system there. He created a very clear base. Um, he worked very well with uh, the, the full national team as well in terms of feeding back reports and such and, and just basically creating that pipeline from when you come into the Spanish youth system. To, to get to the full team. Many of the players that he worked with did go on to uh, to not only just play, but also win things with the main Spain team. Yeah, obviously um, his career recently has been kind of um, based around maybe a bit more of a conservative approach, uh, especially at Sevilla probably. With a, a group that talented, do you think he can kind of transfer his managerial skills to teams that dominate the ball, teams that are, are ins insistent on winning, you know, from, from the first minute of a game? Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, you've gradually seen his style, um, I think, develop. I think I think he understood with Spain under 19 and 21s, he had more um, expressive technical players and also of a high, high quality when you compare it to everything else that he faced at that level. Um, so I think you've kind of seen him become more of a defensive coach um, as time has progressed. And and look, international football is completely different to club football. You have to approach it in, a, in an entirely different way. Um, and I think his last job with Sevilla before he came to Wolves, I think we'd seen, I'd probably, you know, you wouldn't find anybody who disagree by saying that it was very much a defensive system that he ran and quite far removed from what he had when he was with Spain in the 19s and 21s. Okay, and that paved the way, of course, for uh, a first step into club management, um, a first proper step anyway. He had, to, I think, a, a spell at Raya Vallecano previous to that. Um, but um, when he first came to the fore from a, a European football perspective was at Porto uh, down, back in 2014. Um, now, obviously, the, the remit for any Porto manager is very much um, titles, titles, titles. He wasn't quite as successful as that um, second place finish back in 2014-15. Many Wolves fans are, are aware of his relationship with Ruben Neves, giving him his debut back then, but he also worked with Jose Sarr at that time as well. Um, again, working with some some excellent players, uh, a couple listed there, and managed to get to a Champions League quarter-final. What did you make of his time back at Porto? Yeah, I was going to say that was, I think that was the highlight, definitely. I mean, the second leg wasn't good, but they showed in the first leg the quality that they could put across and why I think Lopetegui is a very good tournament manager. Um, but I mean, overall, it was a bit disappointing. But I think Porto weren't helped um, by being badly run at the time, I don't think. And also, I thought there was a lack of guidance in, a, in the capacity of a sporting director as well. I think Lopetegui needs one of those. I think it's really important um, that he has somebody working alongside him to, to identify players. He's not coach, I'd say, um, who, who's very 
strong in the transfer market. And, and that's fine. Look, not a lot of coaches are these days. You look at some of the best clubs right now, they've clearly got people um, working extra hard in the recruitment department while they've got an excellent coach because that isn't their strength. And, and that's fine. So I think he did a lot of positive things at Porto. He brought some good young players through. Of course, you'll know one of them in Ruben Neves. He brought through as a 17-year-old. So Neves knows uh, him Lopetegui more than, I think, better than anyone um, at the club, really. Um, and I think if you look at that, the players that he brought through and also what he had to work with, he, he, did, he did quite well. Um, and it was, it was, a, I think it was a difficult time. And, you know, I don't think, you know, I wouldn't say it was a failure. It was just, it was just an okay time. And for a first step into management as well, it wasn't particularly bad at all. So, I mean, just in terms of obviously Portugal as a league, at the time, were Benfica a particularly strong team as well? Um, obviously, they, they're the two real top teams. Uh, yeah, I think I, Benfica and Sporting were stronger at the time. Were strong at the time, but I think it's largely stemmed from the fact. Look, the, the Portuguese clubs are always. Um, I think the, the success that they can achieve and what they can amount to is very much based upon how they sell and then replace as well. Portuguese teams are always selling. That's that's a fact, and they have to replace sensibly. I think. Lopetegui arrived in Porto at a time when they weren't buying well, when they weren't replacing well, where players were leaving still, but they they just weren't getting the same quality in. And I think that really hurt Lopetegui at the time. For sure, for sure. Um, his next step was uh, was back into international management. Um, and after Vicente Del Bosque uh, retired um, fro- following the 2016 Euros, um, very much kind of a a bit of a almost like a, a Southgate type appointment, having been 21's manager, not necessarily had the best of times at Porto, but was this almost yeah. like the, the Spanish FA promoting from within at that point? Yeah, and like I said previously, he'd done such incredible work. And by that time that he had arrived um, with the main team, a lot of those players that he'd worked with for several years were hitting the main team. So it just made sense. And, uh, I think a lot of the players responded to it really well, and obviously everyone knows the manner of the departure. It was just it was pure madness on the eve of a World Cup. Um, with him, you know, accepting the Real Madrid job, um, it apparently not meant to get out until after the World Cup, and it turns out that he ended up getting sacked because he'd taken that job because the Spanish FA felt they'd been undermined. Um, and I think they were in a great place. They were really, really well with Lopetegui, and I think they would have gone far in the tournament as well um, because they'd shown enough progress under him. He'd done a very good job with Spain. The players, again, had responded to him really, really well. Young players especially always respond well to him, I think. Um, so that that was a disappointment that we didn't get to see him at, uh, at a full tournament, really. I mean, we saw there, like I say, he was presiding over a qualification campaign. I think sometimes uh, the European giants can get a bit of an easy ride um over the course of those qualifications but would you still would you discredit him in any way in that regard or, or do you think it oh, was still really good work absolutely not i think look it was trying times i think it was it, look it was you know it was an excellent qualifying campaign um and there were signs of progress there with the team as well in terms of you know spain always have a problem i think um of playing a lot of possession football and then breaking teams down. And it felt as though he was kind of starting to, you know, hit through that and there were breakthroughs coming. Um, and and like I say, I, I would have expected that I had a really good tournament and, but then everything unfolded like it did in a soap opera manner, really. Yeah, yeah. Um, obviously, mentioned there of uh, Diego Costa's time with, with Lopetegui. Um, he's not quite the player that, that he used to be, but he was very much kind of, uh, the number nine that, that he, he turned to at that point, would you say? Yeah, absolutely. They tried a few different things and, and Costa seemed to fit the best. Um, you know, he was performing very, very well in Europe at the time. Um, and I think it made sense for him to come in. But I think ultimately Costa had kind of paid um, for how he'd played at Atleti for so many years. He was a bit, a bit broken down by then. I think his body was just completely... Um, you know, hindered by that, he'd, he'd, he'd given it all for so many years, and he had that incredible season at Chelsea as well, absolutely incredible. Um, and then he went back to Atleti, but he just wasn't the same then. Um, and I think that's been, it's it's been sad to see, but ultimately, I think it, it is that. And I, I could see 
Wolves definitely still trying to identify a striker um, in the in the January window. Yeah, yeah, and we'll we'll kind of come on to that a little bit later. Um, interestingly, but obviously the fallout from from the the sacking and and the news of him taking on the uh, Real Madrid job, most people would obviously see that as a uh, as too good to turn down. But reputationally, at that point in his career, how low was he held in terms of his regard within the country? Um, would you say? Um, I mean, when he took the job, it was because of the circumstances of the Spain fallout. It was it was seen as really, really disappointing. Um, I think you know, and his reputation really took a hit for that, and how he'd kind of stabbed Spain in the back. Um, and then at Real Madrid, it never worked out. The the progress was slow. I think he was largely hindered by that. I think there was a lot of pressure to have on him after the whole fallout of everything. Um, but ultimately. He tried to change Real Madrid from being this direct counter-attacking beast to a more possession football orientated side um, who would look to grind teams down. Um, he didn't really have the players for that. And I don't think his ideas ever really got across. I don't think the players ever really bought in to his strategy. Um, look, Real Madrid's a... A, a very very unique club um, for both players and coaches. It takes a special special character um, to survive um, there, um, let alone to have success. I think it was just the wrong job at the wrong time for him. I really really do. I can see why he took the job. Look, Real Madrid come calling, then of course you, you, your eyes light up. You think you know I'm going to miss this train if they come for me now. Are they ever going to come for me again? So I can see why he took the job. I can see why Real Madrid went for him. Because Spain were progressing that well, he looked that exciting. They looked like they had their next young Spanish coach as well. Um, but it just it just didn't work out from from all sides. I think Real Madrid thought they were getting a, a better coach. I think Lopetegui probably thought he was ready for the job, and it just didn't work out in in any way at all. How much do you think there was an impact from Cristiano Ronaldo leaving that summer as well? Um, obviously, leaves a massive hole. Personality-wise, um, in terms of the, the group, he might have been perhaps um, on a downward trajectory in his career, maybe already at this stage. But do you think that hindered him in some way? Just lost David there for a minute. Yeah, I definitely think it was. It was a big factor. Look, I mean, Lopetegui was kind of tasked with taking Real Madrid in a new direction, in a different direction. Um, and I just think the task was too big for him. And I think, you know, if you if you looked um, to after that, they then turned to a series of, you know, veteran managers. That was the profile that they were perhaps looking for who could guide the club in that sense. Um, that's why they've still got Ancelotti now and not one of the younger coaches on the market. Um, they've got somebody, you know, safe, better hat, set of hands, a veteran, lots of experience, and it's just what works for them, I think. So, yeah, I just, I, I don't think it was the the, the right opportunity for him. And and, and funnily enough, I'll, at at that time, I think it was right. I think it would have been right to see through with Spain through that World Cup campaign. Judged everything after that, and I think a job like a Valencia or a Sevilla or a Villarreal would have been more apt for him in terms of his next step as a progress. And I guess naturally he did end up uh, ultimately taking on a job like that with Sevilla and, and and making a real success of it. I mean, when when you you kind of bunch those experiences together, a lot of it isn't necessarily um, the most um, successful period as a manager. Obviously, various caveats to that. Um, I think he's clearly built himself a kind of re, rebuilt his reputation back at Sevilla. Um, but a lot of excitement around as as Wolves fans uh, the appointment. How well do you expect him to do at Wolves? I guess I know it's a it's a very open question to you, mm. but based on those experiences, yeah. I honestly think um, he can definitely get them into European places, chasing European football again, Europa League level. I think about then. I think anything above that, I'd be very surprised that um, if we're talking Champions League, getting them into the Champions League, I'd be really surprised. Again, a lot of it will depend on 
external factors like um who is buying players, what's the scouting like, what's the recruitment, what direction is that going in, how much input is Mendes going to continue to have at the club as well. So things like that will will count for. But on the face of things, how I've seen Lopetegui throughout his career, and I've followed him since he first came through, um, I would honestly say that the, he can turn things around at Wolves to get them into like that Europa League sort of level, I think. I, think, I mean, you raise an interesting point again about the Mendes factor and it's always going to be a conversation point uh, at Wolves as a club. But he has made an interesting uh, appointment, um, not necessarily uh, something that the club has led on this, but uh, Fran Garagartha, um, yep. former IBAR sporting director. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the IBAR story? Um, because it's it's probably not one that's uh, too well known uh, within English football and, and Wolves fa- uh, fan base specifically, but it's a pretty extraordinary one, isn't it? It's quite remarkable the way that um, they'd rise through the, you know, rose through the the rankings basically in Spanish football. Um, a very small town, so like a population of under thirty thousand. Um, very organic growth. We're not talking about a rich owner coming in um, and suddenly putting money into the club and then rising through the ranks. Um, it was done organically on ex- excellent squad building, excellent coaching, um, and. Fran Gargatha had a a big hand in that and he had a big hand in not just helping them rise through the ranks but actually becoming a a serious La Liga club, surviving there, staying in the league for many years, operating very much on the same strategy that had helped them build up and come up through the ranks. Um, You know, selling high, buying low, um, being very aware of loans and frees in the market as well, contracts expiring and such. Veteran players were coming available. Young players, perhaps not, uh, perhaps getting let go from bigger clubs, um, and they operated very much like that. And he he became known as one of the most astute operators of the of the transfer market in, in, in Spain for for quite a long period of time. Yeah, I think it's long been held uh, a view that ultimately George Mendes can only take you so far with his his network of, of players and and management and. Mm-hmm. Um, the operation at Wolves has very much lent on him uh, in, to, in order to get the club to this this stage. He's not actually officially been brought in as as a sporting director, it seems, but he's, he is due to work on recruitment um, and scouting alongside uh, Yulen's son, actually Daniel Lopetegui, um, which is an interesting appointment as well. Yeah. And um, so hopefully we see a bit of a step away. Personally, uh, um, think we need to do that to kind of become a bit more of a uh, a robust team in terms of recruitment. I agree, yeah. I think you limit yourselves. Right? If, you're, if you're just operating via Mendes' um, network, you clearly limit yourself. And yes, you will get some fantastic players. You will get some absolute gems come through, but you'll also um, get some duds as well. But generally speaking, I think you've had some really nice players um, through via the Mendes link. It's just a case of getting them to work and getting them to fit. What Garagatha has been so impressive at when he was with at Ibar was identifying the right type of players for his manager and what suited that brand of football. Um, you know, if, if his coach particularly lent on wing backs, for instance, then he was able to identify really impressive wing backs who could uh, deliver crosses and also play high up. Marco Correa, who's at Chelsea now, of course, was was one of the players that was identified by Gabagatha when he was in the Barcelona Youth Academy and was becoming available. Um, he went and had a really impressive loan in there. It was eventually bought by Hatafe and and now we see him, you know, 50, 60 million pound player in, in the Premier League um, playing at a really high level. Um, so that's somebody that, you know, Garagatha looked at and said, like, look, this is a young player we can work with. And that just gives you a little bit of an insight into, in, in, into how he works and how he operates. Do you think we can expect a bit more from the likes of Mateus Nunes and Gonzalo Guedes as well then? Yeah, ab- uh, yeah absolutely. I think Nunes is, uh, Nunes is a player I rate extremely, extremely highly. Um, I said as much when uh, you guys bought him. I thought what oh, a fantastic deal that was to 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 bring him in, and um, I think he could be one of the players to really prosper from from this the most. Uh, from the most, um, I don't think he's really played in his position of strength at Wolves so far, and I think that's yeah. been. I think that's really really hindered him. Um, if you can let him off the leash a little bit and just let him roam a bit more, let him create a bit more play, um, let him really become the person who helps things tick over um, with Ruben Neves, then I think we can see Wolves progress in, in no time. 
talking of uh, potential new signings, um, there is the suggestion that there's money to spend on the January transfer window. A couple of names have already been linked in uh, Nacho and uh, Mariano Diaz as well, both uh, from Real Madrid. Um, can yeah. you tell us a little bit more about those two? Yeah, um, Nacho, um, veteran or older player, but extremely versatile. He's played across the entire back line throughout his career. Um, brilliant. He's just a hard worker, grafter, incredible professional, just the kind of player that everybody wants in their squad because they just know they get ultimate commitment from them. Um, he's not spectacular, but he is just a solid player. Um, do wonder if at this stage in his career, the Premier League's the best move for him. I don't know about that one. Um, Mariano Diaz, again, just one who came back to Real Madrid after just an incredible time at Lyon. Um, his, his shooting technique's fantastic, but for whatever reason, he's just never got a correct, a true run in the Real Madrid team. And look, when you've got Karim Benzema, and, you know, best striker in the world in front of you, then it is going to be difficult to break in. Um, chances have been very few and far between. Um, and he's definitely somebody who needs a move. And again, it could be somebody, you know, still worth working with, I think, and, and, and giving a try. Yeah, I think um, we can definitely see a need for, for, for goals at the club at the moment. Uh, it's It's been pretty pitiful uh, so far this season. But um, we'll we'll wrap it up there, David. I really appreciate your time. Can you just remind everybody where they can find your work? Yeah, sure. Um, just follow me on Twitter, David Jagger, that's J-A-C-A. Um, and I appear at ESPN and on the Football Ramble as well. Excellent. Thank you very much for your time. Uh, don't forget to like and subscribe, everybody. Um, and uh, we'll be back soon with more content, I'm sure. Cheers. Um.